Okay, so um, this is the period designated for a Q&A session in English. So I'm, I'm very fluent in English. I, I studied it at school when I, in England. Um, but if there's any word I can't think of, I'll ask Ajahn Jill to tell me. <laughs> Um, so we don't have any any English questions here so far. So oh, maybe there's some coming. But um, if anybody just wants to ask normally, just um, uh, put up your hand or or Anjali or something, and um, you can just uh, for many. Many years, uh, so many times, I I remember having conversations with Americans and English and Australian people teaching in in Thailand, of being frustrated that um, people don't ask questions like they do in in England or America, and they concluded from that a sort of a lack of interest in in the topic in this, that they were teaching, they'd be discouraged. And I would say, no, you're just doing it in the wrong way. Um, you know, you have to understand that most Thai people don't feel so comfortable in, in um, publicly asking questions in public. Um, <clears throat> but they are, if you give them the opportunity to write their questions down, you get really good questions. Uh, I think better than he, or as good as, or as better as you would get in your own country. So I always thought it's a good example of of sense that you know the Western way is always the kind of the universal or the way everyone else should do it. But there are um, you know make adaptations to local cultures, and you can be quite surprised at um, the results. So I've I found giving school children chances, uh, opportunity to answer questions, and uh, really been um, really um, impressed by the quality of, of questions. So I do this on a, um, every every Wednesday. I go to Banyar Pratip School, and and uh, one week I give a, a, a dhamma talk, and one week is a kind of Q and A session, and then there's a second Q and A session for individual students um, in a, in one class every week, and yeah, the questions are really good. So, um, so one of the questions the day the other day was, what makes a question a good question? This was this was <laughs> this was one of the children asked. Um, Okay, so we don't have any written Thai questions, so please go ahead. Anything at all could be about meditation, Buddhism in general, or absolutely anything. It's sort of we're informal, Ben Gan Eng. Does anyone like to ask or discuss anything? Yeah. Deal with like stress during exams and such. Yeah, I think there are a number of things involved, and I, I think the first thing is to to recognize a distinction between pressure and stress. So you know, wherever you are and, and whatever stage of your um, studies or your career, you're always going to be in positions where there's pressure on you of one kind or another. And that's, so that's a life skill to learn, isn't it? How to deal with pressure. So when, when you haven't really trained your mind, then pressure almost inevitably leads to stress until they sort of think there's one and the same thing. But I think it's possible to, to deal with a lot of pressure from, even from different directions and not be stressed out. And so the stress has come really from thinking, doesn't it? It's just thinking about the pressures rather than the actual work itself, which 
at the end of the day, it's just one step at a time, you know, how well, whatever you think about it, that's what you're left with because you have no choice. So um, recognizing stress producing productive thoughts as they arise in your mind um, and neither following them nor repressing them, just recognizing them and allowing them. This is, this is how you develop a very good mental habit and that deals with stress, anxiety, so many other negative mental states which, um, which really become extreme because of the tendency of the mind just to go round and round and round and round in, in things that are as yet have, have no resolution. But um, so that's the kind of the internal Buddhist practice. And so, and it's not anything really mystical. It means making an investment of time to develop that kind of mindfulness muscle, which you can call upon, because you have to have that sharpness of, and, you have, and you have to have that facility with just knowing what's going on in your body and mind moment by moment and not just sort of getting caught up with things. But the other more mundane element of it is just things like time management. So what I see in a lot of students is that they get stressed out because they leave everything to the last moment um, and not really planning out their, um, their workload well enough. So it's sort of external mundane things like time management together with this like internal development of mindfulness and dealing with um, stress-producing thoughts. If you can also observe, tend to be kind of patterns of thinking, you know, that you tend to, divert, to fall into particular ruts. And so if you can recognize those particular ruts or those particular patterns, then, then you, you can get, that helps to be really sharp when they're just starting to arise in your mind. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Um, if I may, could, could you could you take your mask so I can hear more clearly? Yeah. 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 And, uh, can you use the microphone? And, uh, yeah. If I may, uh, I would like to ask, what would you have done if you haven't become a monk? What would I have done? You know, it's. Um, so so hard to um, think about that now because I I'm 65 and I you know I wanted to be a monk since I was like 18 so I can hardly even remember anything before I either wanted to be a monk or became a monk. But um, my I tell you my work experience I <laughs> I I worked in a in a warehouse. After I finished my A-levels, I just didn't want to use my brain anymore. I just wanted to use my body. So I, I, I worked in a warehouse just sort of lifting boxes onto piles of boxes, and I really enjoyed it. And, and then I worked on a building site, so I was made, um, making some money. Then I worked on a farm. Um, my idea, um, one idea I had was to be a... Um, like a cattle herder or a sheep herder, because um, in in Switzerland. So I actually sort of pursued this, went up into the mountains, to, but I didn't really have the language skill because um, it's the idea you you just go up into the mountains and um, you know the, the 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 cattle can sort of eat they feed the cattle twice a day and then you have the rest of the day for meditation, but. Um, <clears throat> Also, when I was a student, um, I, was, I, I very much liked the novels of Jack Kerouac. I don't know if anybody read any Jack Kerouac. <clears throat> it's like a beat, um, sort of uh, cool guy in the 1950s. And so he had a friend. Um, he's actually based on a real-life figure who's a great Zen um, practitioner and poet afterwards called Gary Snyder. <clears throat> But in, in America in those days, you could get a job as like a, um, 
they 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 helicopter you in, and then you go up to this this uh, little cabin up high up on a on a on a um, you know sort of a, a platform, and then you just watch out for fires. So that's your job. You're a fire watcher in a national park, and I thought that's a really good thing to do. You can just read and meditate and just sort of make sure there's no fires and um and then the other the other um so i really thought i'd like to do is i um one of the really inf books that really influenced me as a teenager was called siddhartha by herman hesse so maybe some of you anybody read that book herman hesse siddhartha Okay, so the, we're all going back a long time ago now. But he, um, it's a fantastic, they made a movie out of it or so, you can watch the movie. And um, so it's about this young man who who's, um, belongs to some kind of ascetic group. Um, and then he decides to leave and to explore the world. Uh, he feels he's got enough kind of spiritual strength to deal with all the temptations of the world in the beginning he does um and then he gets caught up in the world and making money and family and and then finally he um sort of comes to his senses and leaves the ho leaves his home for a second time and uh, he becomes a disciple of this spiritual teacher who um has a boat which he rows backwards and forwards across the river, taking pilgrims um, to holy, uh, who are going on this holy route. And yeah, so that was the other, that was the other livelihood. I thought, yeah, just something completely blameless and, and like Ben Bun, you know, just rowing people across a river to a place where they need to go. So those are the kinds of, I don't know whether I would have ever, I uh, really pursued them. I um, I think I could have been an undertaker. I've done quite a lot of um, work in, in funerals and preparing dead bodies and things like that, and kind of something of a gift for that. So I, maybe I could have gone into <laughs> Yeah, I don't really know. I do. I'm just really happy I found this way of life. I do. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yes, at the back. There, there. There. Uh, well, I kind of curious about like how you define the word of understanding yourself. When I read a book, like people say, okay, you're born with something that you have to do, but there's an inner voice or inner, like, yeah, inner voice in your head, like, to kind of force you to, like, do something. Not forcing like that, but I mean, like, there's a purpose of, like, when, when we were born, we, we have to, like, doing something, but I don't know, like, is it a concrete concept to... Yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't completely agree with that. I, I think certainly, um, given the fact that you know this isn't the first time we've been born. This you know this is just one um, uh, just one episode of a very long soap opera. Um, but the but given the fact that you do have karmic, um, uh, both good and bad karma that you've created in the past creates certain kind of tendencies and, and potentials. So I think the way that we look at, at karma is, is like, it's like potential. You can sometimes, I mean, you can see this with like child prodigies, like math prodigies or musical prodigies, you know, obviously they're, this is something that comes from past lives. But I, I don't agree with the kind of common modern idea that everyone has some kind of thing they have to do in their life and, and then they have to search for this kind of great passion in their life and follow that and follow their dream. And 
um, I, I think I kind of um, find that kind of facile. The and I think it it it, it really um, creates a lot of unnecessary suffering. I've seen many teenagers particularly feeling inadequate you know what's wrong with me i don't have a passion i should have a passion how can i find my passion you know and it's like you know it's like um something a real personality defect and i i said why um you know first of all people who have great passion before they even really commit themselves to something um, it's very rare, I would say, from my experience. And the other thing is that in many cases, passion comes as the result of committing yourself to something rather than having to have it before you start. Because when you, when you really apply yourself to something and you find, oh, yeah, I'm quite good at this and I can do this and I enjoy doing it, and, then, and, and as time goes on, you find this real passion for it coming, but the idea that you have to find the passion first before you you really commit yourself to anything in life, I, I that's not something I I would agree with. And I think we have so many um, different potentials. And as a Buddhist, you know the, the the number one potential is potential for for liberation, and that's why being born in the human realm is considered you know great good fortune because we can um, develop spiritually in this realm in a way which is um, very difficult or impossible in other realms. So having this sort of ethical, moral, spiritual liberation as a sort of a guiding light, and then, you know, in what way you learn, you, you make your living or you, you follow, then, that, then that's something that should try, try to make that in harmony with your life goals in terms of, you know, your your spiritual development. So I think that sometimes there's too much emphasis on the on the career side, and then maybe you know people are like often like forty years old or something before they wake up to the spiritual dimension of life. And I think that it's not um, emphasizing the spiritual dimension in uh, in preference or over the academic or the career goals, but finding a way to find some harmony between them. Hello. Oh, um, if I may ask, I've been taught that in Buddhism, our bodies, our consciousness is not our own. We're made up of the five aggregates. Um, but I'm wondering when we say that our good or bad karma is attributed to ourselves, what do we mean by ourselves? And is our, our thought or our action a product of the five aggregates or are they mm. something entirely different? Well, the, the five aggregates is, is a scheme. Um, by which we get, which is meant to enable us to investigate our life, our body and mind. So there are categories and ways, just like fo different focusing focuses of the um, of, of contemplation and understanding. As we tend to think, there's this kind of solid, independent me standing behind experience. And so, using teachings like the five khandhas or the four elements, these are ways of kind of deconstructing. The, the assumptions that, that we make about our lives and looking more clearly about what's really there. Um, so in any, unless in any endeavor, um, when we're looking at like cause and effect, how do we produce an effect? And, and I think particularly clear in, in meditation or spiritual life, that there's always like a factor X, which we, can, we, can, we cannot, um, put any number on, we can't quantify it, um, which is the, the comma from our past lives, the, the inheritance we have from past lives. So, one, you know, we can 
if we want to talk about that in a um, in in a, a scientific way, you know, we talk about heredity and environment. You know what? How important is it your genes? How important are your genes, and how important are your environment? So there's been a long debate about this for a long time, hundred years or more, and and generally, I think the the consensus now is about fifty fifty. You know, so what you bring with you from through your genes, and then fifty percent is what you what you do with that, or the the conditions, the experiences you have in your life. With regard to the uh, the kama, then you can't sort of point to it in the five in the five uh, khandas in that way, although it will manifest as that. Um, so, so for instance, let's say you have a your your kama is you you um, you have a potential or you have a um, you have a there's a high likelihood that you will um, let let's say find a life in which you can help other people, let's say, because you've done a lot of good things in the past, and so you find drawn to ways of living your life that you can help other people. So you can, that's, we say, that's a, a karmic thing, but you have to, you have to um, apply yourself to that as well and develop the skills to help other people and put yourself in the situation where you can do that. So all those skills and the mental states and the understanding that's not something that's there all the time, but it's you have a potential for it. So the so we can look at the the kama as sort of potentialities. So like with genes, was also you know with they, there was this idea that somehow genes are destiny. You know, once you work out the genome, then you know exactly what. And they found that that wasn't the case. And with with genes, it's almost like there's an on-off switch. You know, you have a gene that maybe makes you susceptible to a particular kind of cancer, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get that kind of cancer. For instance, if you, you know, depending on how you live your life, depending on how you look after your mind, that switch may never get get pressed. So the again, genes and kama, I think they have this this kind of parallel kind of uh, functions that that they 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 are potentials, but not destiny. They're not like this is definitely going to happen. Good morning, I'm wondering, is it possible to listen to music without losing sati to live in sorry listen to music without losing sati or when we allow our emotions or feelings to be swayed by music does it mean that we lose awareness or sati because maybe when we i think when we take in art visually i feel like we have a distance that we can be aware of what we're taking in, but I don't know about music or when we hmm. sometimes we can say that we lose ourselves in in music. Well, um, yeah, I guess like music is a very broad category, isn't it? And there are very different kinds of of music. Um, yeah, well, the first point I would make is that the um, in Dhamma practice, like the first big goal is we call stream entry. It's like the four levels of enlightenment. And the first level is called stream entry. And that's really the crucial one. Um, and the Buddha gave this simile. He said, if all the suffering that you've experienced in past lives was compared to earth, it would be like all the earth in the world would be like the suffering that you've experienced in the past. But if you reach stream entry, the suffering that remains is like the amount of dirt you could get under your fingernail. So it means like 99.999% of suffering is over once you realize this, um, this level. And that level is, is the first level will inevitably lead to the fourth and final level within seven lifetimes. 
is why it's called it's entering the stream, because now you're on the stream to Nibbana. Now, one of the reasons why this first level of enlightenment is um, so important is that um, many householders over past huge number of householders um, keeping five precepts have realized this, um, this level. So if listening to music um, meant that you couldn't develop in Dhamma, and it was a, like a major obstacle or serious obstacle, the Buddha would have included it within the five precepts because the five precepts is the basic standard. But you'll observe when, when you go on retreat usually, I mean, m most retreats we do, we go on to eight precepts. And so the, the extra precepts are not anything to do with ethics and good and bad. You know, there's things like not eating in the evening, not putting on makeup, not listening to music, all these kinds of things. So they're all kind of the extra unessential parts of life. So you just want to simplify and get around just down to looking at your body and mind. So people, lay people, lay householders will, will do this. So maybe on every one pra, one every uposata, four times a month, two times a month, or they'll go on meditation retreats. And that's when you put all those things aside and you really focus on, on Dhamma practice. But I, I would say for a householder, listening to music is not, you know, um, a serious obstacle and it's um, just part of, you know, one of the um, permissible enjoyments of life. Um, but we, as with anything, you know, you need to know what's, you know, what's the right amount and not, you know, if at any time you get stressed out and you have this kind of automatic um, go-to, you know, for some people it might be uh, going online and, and buying something, somebody else would be taking alcohol or a drug or somebody else it might be music. Music is superior to those, but it, still it's, you know, if it's a means of just sort of getting away from your present situation, then, then it's not such a good habit. But if it's just something that you enjoy, and um, you know, I know people who for work in music therapy, for instance, and can use uh, music in to to help people a lot, or to um, using uh, music, traditional Thai music with um, the elderly is uh, also a good thing that people are developing. Um, Again, I think there's music and music, you know, there's um, some of the classical music, like Eastern classical music, the, there are uh, Buddhist-influenced or uh, meditation-influenced music can be a very um, good way to just to calm the mind down before beginning meditation even. There's um, uh, sitar music. I used to like is a layman sitar music, Indian sitar music, because it's just so, it just feels so organic and natural. And it's just like you're listening to some kind of natural rhythms, like in the forest. Um, so observing what, what music does to you, you know, if it really stirs you up or is relaxing or you know, and, and recognizing, yeah, that's, that's one, one part of life. So short answer, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not sure, um, yeah, you maybe lose mindfulness a little bit if you're taking a high standard of mindfulness, but not seriously enough to be a, an obstacle to spiritual progress. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask what your thoughts are on change. Um, change in terms of change of personality, change of behavior, change of mindset. Um, I'm, I'm a believer that change can be beneficial to someone. Um, I think it adds more depth to one's character, for better or for worse. I think it also adds a new range of experiences to someone's life that can make it more fulfilling. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I, I, uh, it's a huge topic because, you know, um, you know, Buddhism is basically the study of change and understanding change. Um, so 
that's probably too you know broad and profound a topic to um, to 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 um, deal with right now. But I, just a couple of thoughts I would give you. You see that there, there tend to be two kind of extreme um, reactions to change. Um, one is like conservatism and and holding on to to old things for their own sake because they give you a sense of stability um, and uh, and then people people who who really attach to that um, feel very threatened by and angry about about change because it's like a threatening their whole stability and their whole um, sense of who they are. And the other extreme is like change for change's sake. You know, it's like um, something is new. It must necessarily be superior to something which is old. Um, This idea of being modern and being um, up to date and and sometimes... um, really good things that have, and the reason why some things have been around for a long time is because they're really good things you know and they've been tried and tested over centuries um and the idea that because it's old therefore you know, throw it out to get the 21st century or the modern modern age so um that that's a bit foolish and these days there seem to be like this this you get these kind of fashions, you know, the latest one is like innovation, you know, it's got, got to innovate. But what does innovate mean? I mean, just do something in a different way, doesn't it? But whether it's a better way or a, uh, a worse way, you know, that's something they that really have to, to think through. Because um, when you change something, there are all kinds of like stresses and, and retraining or, or, you know, recalibration, all kinds of costs to, to innovation, um, and so quite often then they outweigh the, the pros. But just this idea that everything you know, should look to, to innovate, some, you know, you look that because there's a class of things, aren't they, that we, we can never f- come up with a better way um, than that. L- example, like spoon, okay, you know, I don't think we need to innovate spoons. I mean, spoons is a really good job, you know, you, you get something, and you put it in your mouth, you know, and I mean, how can you innovate on that? So that's just one. So there's obviously a class of things that are well designed. And as long as human beings have mouths like this um, and still have to eat food, there's no need to innovate spoons, is there? You know, or you think that, well, yeah, actually, we could divine a spoon and you could tip it in your ear maybe and then allow the fluid to fall down into your mouth. Well, that'd be cool, you know. And then you maybe you could have designed special napkins to mop up the mess and have a whole package. But sometimes some of the innovation in the world is, is, is as ridiculous as that, I think. Um, so I, I think change is an opportunity, you know, to every now and again to just come out of what you're used to. Like when I, when I was 15, um, I... I, I went on a trip with some friends, most of them older than we, we, we rented a minibus and we drove from England to Morocco um, in the summer holidays. And for me as a 15 year old boy, I lived in like a small town in England, just to see a whole new culture, whole new language. And I'm very, um, very wordy. So seeing signs and lang- you know, in, in, in word letters I couldn't understand, you know, this really um, kind of weird and, and disturbing for me. And um, so I, I, I really learned something important from that experience because I realized that all the things I sort of taken for granted growing up in England, well, these were just the, the ways that a little, you know, a, people on a little island in the northwest corner of Europe did things, you know, and how could I be sure that the way they did things and the things they believed were any superior to the way that people did things in Northern Africa or their beliefs? So I, that was really um, awakening, you know, sort of experience for me. Then, and I had the idea that the more things you see and the more experiences you have, 
the more you learn. And then I, you know, uh, so I traveled a lot between ages 17 and 20 um, all over the world. And, <clears throat> and I met a lot of people who'd been traveling and having all kinds of uh, exotic experiences. And yet at a certain period, people just shut down. They develop a certain set of beliefs and frameworks for their experience. And then everything sort of fits into that. And they stop learning from change and from their experience. So it seemed to me this is a really important quality to cultivate in your life, that curiosity and interest um, and sensitivity and openness to things. Well, without that, even if you have all these kinds of exotic experiences, that um, they don't really um, have much value for you individually. Anything else? We've got one or two. Yes, somebody. Namaskar, Bhajan. First things first, I'm a big fan of you. <laughs> right, and second of all, uh, I've been doing research on aging. Hmm. So to make people healthier, maybe hmm. they live longer, hmm. or ultimately being immortal. But uh, one of the incarnation in this book here saying that uh, I'm of the nature to age, I have not gone beyond aging. Uh, so does this mean that I should stop and people should stop? Because we have been doing this for like 20 years or even longer, maybe hundreds of years, to find the, uh, the immortality uh, chill. Mm. So what was your suggestion? Well, I, I think working to um, increase the, the quality of life of elderly people, that's something really worse. Um, but I think that's the key term, the quality as opposed to quantity. You know, because often people think that just sort of uh, living longer is, is, a, is a good in itself. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say that because I've, you know, you've probably um, seen yourself people in the last stage of their life um, and being kept alive with technology um, and um, really suffering a lot, um, simply to add a few few more days to your life, you know, and to say, for, well, for what, really? And for what purpose? Uh, I think it's possible now we can, we're seeing the average um, median age is, is it's increased a lot, even in my lifetime. So now there's got people who are 80, 90 years old, even 100 years old, um, Tanjan Pasano, a friend of mine who's, who was uh, abbot at Wat Nanashat before me, uh, his mother just celebrated her 100th birthday and have a big party and she's there. And she's, she's uh, you know, this, it's uh, more and more normal. I think that it's possible that may be able to extend life, life expectancy probably to, I would say, maximum 120, I think. Um, it's probably maximum. But then again, it's like, what for? And uh, you often say to people when you get monks give blessing, you know, you say ayu, when you know, so may you have a long life. But you know, when when you wish someone a long life, actually, you're wishing may you be an old person for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what, that's what it really means, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't sound so, <laughs> such a... May you be an old person for a really long time. You know, it's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, I think um, finding ways to extend people's lives is, you know, if the emphasis is on, on, on quality, but also just recognizing, you know, big picture of things. You live an extra five years or ten years um, in terms of samsara and millions and millions of lifetimes you know it's not such a not such a big deal but um you know we're we're entering a period now where a bigger and bigger proportion of our population um, are elderly and uh, working um, together to increase uh, um, expectation particularly in quality of life i think that's really important work to do yeah.
I've got a couple of written questions. Um, okay, how to calm down when people get mad with me? Okay. Well, um, in, in any kind of stressful situation, like when someone's shouting at you or when someone's really angry with you, the first thing to do is come back to your body. That's just number one. Come back to body awareness. Just breathe in, breathe out, like I was teaching. Because one of the reasons why the breath is such an interesting object of study is because the, the breath is that part of the body which is so intimately connected with the mind. So if, you're, if your mind is very agitated, your breath's agitated. Um, if your mind's calm, your breath's calm, and so on. So when you're agitated, your breathing will come, you know, become short and irregular. So first, first things first, breathe, breathe deep, breathe in, breathe out, and just feel, feel the whole body from your head down to your toes. And as you feel this stress and tension, just feel it like draining down into the earth through your feet. Just breathe, as you breathe, breathe out, let it go down into, into your feet. Um, if, um, Depends who's angry with you also, isn't it? I mean, if, if it's um, like a mum or dad or something, sometimes you just have to just uh, sit there or stand there and, and be patient. Um, if it's a uh, friend or boyfriend or girlfriend, then maybe it's, uh, you know, it's a time where you just say, look, um, uh, maybe we could just uh, take five minutes here and, and come back and, and talk with this when we're, um, both a little bit calmer, so taking time out when you're both getting upset and agitated. Um, not, not giving the impression you're trying to run away. You're saying, look, I, um, I really do, um, ready to talk about this, but I don't think this is really the right time now. Let's just take a, um, just take a break and come back to talk about this. Um, in terms of the sort of principles of of good communication and in times of strong emotion, then um, always start off with you and I don't um, don't start telling people you are this you are that kind of person you're always like this you're never like that so those those uh, when you're having difficult conversations. Um, this point of mindfulness, never use the word always or never. Um, if you tell somebody you always do something, immediately their mind's like supercomputer fast. They find just, if they can find just one example where that's not true, then they'll feel like noijai, you know, you're not being fair to them. Or if you say you never, then they'll, you know, they'll find just one example of when they did, and then they're in the right again, you see. So... Um, you say, um, talk about things that um, you can, specific things that you've seen or you've heard or you've experienced and how you felt about those things. And so it's you're giving um, information to the other person and trying, um, but the moment you start um, assuming that you know that person, you know their thoughts and you know their intentions, um, then there's no real communication going to take place. Um, so um, when someone is really angry with you, you know, there's sometimes, well, you've done something wrong, you know, so there's, you know, there's cause and effect there. Isn't it? But if, even if somebody is uh, being unfair, angry about something which is not the case, um, then... You know, remember that that person is really um, angry with their idea of who you are. You know, they don't, nobody knows who you are really, and all of the subtleties and um, you know the inner um, workings of your mind. But someone has, a, you know, if it's not a, a simple uh, dispute over something you've done, but it's about perceptions and so on, then um, this is a good reflection that this person 
has a distorted understanding of, of who you are, and they're angry with that distorted understanding rather than they're angry with who you are. So if you if you you can, there are various ways of of dealing with this and thinking about it. But first aid, kind of dealing with it immediate, is just breathe, breathe normally, and just feel. Imagine the stress going down into the ground. That's a good way to start. Um. <clears throat> so. It seems like so many people demand so much attention from me, but it is never the other way around. Why do I feel so guilty about it, and how can I feel less bad? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I, I, there's a very there's a sort of old old word you, you probably all know, and um, people don't use it so much these days. And in Thai, is na na jitang. You know, we're we're all different. We're all different. We don't have to be the same as anybody else, and we but we also don't have to sort of make a big point of being different from everybody else. Well, yeah, we're, we're just who we are. We're like this right now, and we're changing. We're changing, they're changing. You know, this is the insight of um, Buddha. It's like there's nothing fixed within us at all. Everything is the product of habit and repetition. And um, if you have some negative quality in your mind, well, then find the causes and conditions of it and stop feeding them. If you want to develop a good quality, it's not beyond you. You have the potential to do that, but you have to be systematic and you have to develop it um, patiently over a long period of time. So, you know, I'm, I'm, the, the, I'm not quite sure about, so people are asking a lot from you. Well, do you find that Oppressive? Do you find that too much? Um, do you find it difficult to say no? And then, you know, that's, those are things to work on, creating boundaries for yourself. Now, we all need those kind of boundaries. We can't, just as we can't or shouldn't just live for ourselves, we can't just live for other people either. And this, again, this is, I think, important life skill to learn how to find that balance between your own welfare and and uh, contributing to your family and to your community and to the society at large. Um, that's a really important thing to learn as a human being, isn't it? Um, feeling guilty then, um, yeah, I, I have a, a whole kind of theory about, about this because there, there are, let, let's say from anthropological point of view, they, they sometimes do divide cultures into shame cultures and guilt cultures. So the West are definitely guilt cultures. And, and Thailand and Asia, um, generally shame cultures. But now over the past 10, 20 years, more and more Western influence, then uh, sort of more and more Thai people uh, have fallen foul of this guilt, guilty illness. <laughs> this kind of... Um, sad state of mind. So what's the difference between guilt and shame? Well, in, there are different ways of explaining these terms, but I, this is my understanding. Um, when you've done something, said something bad, foolish in the past, how, how, do, you, how do you process that and how do you deal with that? So the, 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 the Western way influenced by teachings of Christianity in particular and, and the Abrahamic religions um, says that you are a bad person and this is ultimately just deeply you are fallen you know you are sinful you're a bad person so when you act you're just acting upon this this badness um, and people feel um, bad the, in short, the idea is 
I did this, I did that, I am a bad person. So the contrast in the Buddhist um, point of view is that looking bad at a bad action, recognize it, take responsibility for it, but to understand it as a function of the situation and the mental states um, that prevailed when that action was performed. For instance, let's, let's say we, we look back at something that we did which is really we really regret now, and we say, well, at that moment that I did that thing, I just had so little mindfulness, so little patience, so little compassion, um, and so much anger, and so much greed, so much jealousy, and so on. And then you say, well, how could it be other, any otherwise? You know, the power of these negative qualities was so strong, and the power of the kusala dhammas, the positive qualities, was so weak, then, yeah, how could, <laughs> what else could have happened? Um, but the, the, um, the, the lesson that we take from that is, I really need to find a way to reduce the amount of greed and, and anger and jealousy and so on in my mind. I really need to find a way to increase the amount of mindfulness and kindness and wisdom in my mind so that if I'm in that situation again, um, I will not make the same mistake. So in the guilty framework, you have this idea of a self, a self who is bad and is bad because of the things it does. Whereas in the shame, um, we call a hiriotapa um, view, then we have actions that are performed with a mind um, which has been influenced or dominated by defilement. And that is something that we need to deal with. So I, I would think like guilt tends to be like toxic, you know, it's like, um, Men, leads to a lot of uh, mental health problems, where a shame, as I've explaining it, um, actually leads to um, growth and and um, spiritual development. Okay, I think was we'll just... okay. We've got to have to leave some of these for next time. I think. Uh, maybe we'll just carry on this morning, and um, so I don't have very long together. So this this is a kind of meditation question, anyway. How how do you let go of a recurring thought, a memory you want to leave in the past? Um, so returning to to something I mentioned before, you te- there tend to be two ha- uh, two like knee jerk reactions to things that happen. In whether it's outside or inside, one with a mental state or a memory or a thought is, I don't want this in my get away, go away, and try and get rid of it. Um, and so you may try to get rid of it just by making yourself busy. You know, when somebody uh, loses someone they love, that's often they want to just just don't give yourself a minute's thought, just be busy, um, or else use alcohol or use drugs just to. Um, take you away from that. Um, so obviously that's not a very healthy, and it doesn't work because um, you're actually feeding it, you're giving it that memory even more strength by reacting to it in that way. Um, the other extreme is just to indulge in it, and just to be going thinking over and over and over and over and over again. And again, each time you do that, you feed it. So the, the path of, of mindfulness is that you have that awareness, you cultivate that awareness um, that when this thought just begins to arise in your mind, you're alert to it um, and you just look at it. 
So you, you resist the temptation just to follow it or to hold it down and push it away and kind of destroy it. And you just look at it like that. It's that much. That's what it is. It's just this. Um, and then when you don't feed it, either with liking or disliking, it passes away. It doesn't pass away forever. It comes back. But every time that you're sharp enough to be there and just allow it to be there um, until it passes away, it becomes weaker. And it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and eventually um, disappears. So you have to be very patient and you have to be very diligent in, in doing this again and again and again. Um, but this is the, the very best way of dealing with those um, kinds of anxieties and um, memories and thoughts, like traumatic um, thoughts of some kind or another. Um, is it okay to say no sometime? Well, yes, absolutely. Um, I should hope so, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, um, it would be a really dangerous situation, you know. Um, so, again, you know, looking at, at that difficulty in saying no, where does that come from? Um, why is it so difficult? And sometimes it's just, um, you say, personality since you were a kid. Sometimes it's just like really wanting to please people and um, not wanting to hurt people's feelings. So that can be quite wholesome in some way, not, not wanting to make somebody uh, feel uncomfortable, unpleasant, or disappointed. But it all can also can become a bit neurotic, where your, your idea of your worth as a human being is too tied up in what other people think of you. Um, and so you, you end up... Um, saying yes to things that you really don't want to be involved in, um, simply uh, out of a fear of being disliked or made fun of or, or um, losing someone's, uh, someone's um, friendship. So those are big things in life, aren't they? So it's understandable. I, my, uh, as, as a kind of a tip, I... I, my personality, I also find difficult to, to say no when people ask, ask and make demands on me. And the, um, but I, I found that uh, when you have very clearly defined boundaries, it makes it a lot easier. Um, for example, when I came to, to live here in the hermitage at the back of this um, so I, you know, I have a lot of people invite me to do a lot of different good things, all good things, you know, and all both here in Thailand and overseas. And um, you know, if I was to accept every invitation, I, I'd never spend any time here at all. So my answer to that was to make a determination that in one year. I have to spend at least 300 nights here in this place. And so any invitations that, it, that require overnight stay that can have to be within 65 days in a year that are left. And so um, with that, it gave me, I, I found I could say no much more easily. I said, well, like, it's a really good thing and yes, I really want to support you in this. But, you know, I have my, my quota. I have my my um, my determination. So when you say no, if it's just like, you know, I don't want to or I um, don't feel like it right now, people are going to push you some more or I'll say maybe they're going to feel noijai or, or whatever. But when you're doing it from a principle, well, look, I, I've made a commitment to uh, do so many hours on my, uh, on my project and um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to fulfill the, those hours if I go out tonight. So sorry, you know, I'd love to go, but I can't. So it's saying no with some some principle involved. That that's the way that I that I deal with it. Um, 
So what are the important ingredients of having pure five sila for the rest of human life? Wow, great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, there's, there's a lot to, to, to say about sila. Um, again, the, the influence of, of Western ideas about morality and ethics are so strong um, that Buddhist understanding is, is often... Um, distorted. So if you have like a, like a belief system religion, like I was talking about last night, well, where, does, where does ethics come from? Where does your idea of what's right, what's wrong, what you should do, what you shouldn't do? Well, it's in your book. Um, and these are the commands of your God. And they're usually backed up with a reward and punishment um, system whereby if you do the things that um, the, the deity or the God wants you to do, you'll get a reward, and if you don't, you'll get punished. So this idea of commands uh, enforced through rewards and punishment, carrot and stick, that's the kind of uh, Western idea of morality. In my, not, of course, there are, there are different views, but this is the mainstream so in an education system kind of religion, then how do we decide what's right, what's wrong, what should be done, shouldn't be done? Um, do we look on Buddha as, as like God who just tells us, you know, um, do this, don't do that? Are the five precepts five commandments? Well, no, they're not, because the... Uh, these are, you can see this from the, the, um, the way in which they are um, translated. Let's say you take first precept. It's like say, I undertake um, the precept of not killing or not harming. Um, so it's, it's an, you undertake something. And here the important point is it has to be voluntary. So sila in, in, in Buddhism has to be voluntary. If you just say not killing somebody because you're afraid of going to jail, um, or you don't steal because you're afraid someone's going to cut your hand off, then you would um, be behaving in a, um, you know, in, a, in a good way, but it wouldn't be sila in the Buddhist sense because it's not coming from the right motivation. So sila is very, so motivation is central to sila. You have to see um, the value of keeping each precept very clearly, and you have to see the suffering and the pain and the difficulties and problems that will come from not keeping that precept. So that's how precepts become uh, really strong and firm, because you really see how they contribute to living the kind of life you want to live, and in creating and sustaining the kind of communities that you want to live in. So we, we start off in, in Buddhism not from belief in, in ultimate principles, but observation. Buddha wants us to observe. And so one of the obs observations we need is, um, what is the sort of the bottom line? You know, we can say for anyone to have any kind of happiness in life. What do you need before anything else, um, before you can have any kind of hope of, of happiness in life? Well, we say the four, the four requisites you need. Well, you need adequate food, shelter, clothing, medicine in times of sickness. Um, anything else? Yes, you need to feel safe, don't you? Safety is an um, underlying um, value that that uh, all healthy societies need to sustain. So even if you were, let's say you had like the um, private phone number of an arahant and you could get like one-on-one -on -one advice on your spiritual life 24 hours a day, you know, um, but you're living in a, in a place in which you feel fundamentally unsafe, uh, you don't dare walk out the door, or every time someone you love's gone out the door, you're, you're 
you're not sure whether they'll be able to get, come back again. Um, I don't think your meditation would be very good because without a foundational sense of safety, um, we can't, we can't, we're not prepared, we don't dare to let go of anything. You know, we, when we're unsafe, we're just holding on to everything very tight. But to let go of things, you have to feel that kind of safety and relaxation. So it's very much um, connected with meditation and um, other areas of our, our life. So given the fact that everybody has defilements, you know, has greed, has anger and delusion of various kinds, then what would be, what would be the means, the mechanism by which we can create families and, and communities where everybody feels fundamentally safe? <clears throat> and and the Buddhist answer is when people voluntarily take on the five precepts. Because you're not saying you don't have any greed, anger. Um, you're still those are like works in progress. You know you're trying to deal with those things, but in the meantime, short term, you make these commitments to the people around you that even when you're angry, you know you won't abuse anyone physically or verbally. Even if you're really greedy and you see something you really want, you won't take anything that doesn't belong you, to you. Even if occasionally you might see another man or another woman other than your partner and feel some sexual desire for them, you won't follow up on it. Uh, you can't prevent yourself from having angry thoughts or greedy thoughts or lustful thoughts. Those are just part of nature. Um, but you can make a commitment not to act upon them. And this is, this is the foundation of sila, where you're saying this is how you make everybody around you uh, feel safe. And um, so you, you give that sense of uh, your haikwam sabaijai with everybody around you by taking his precepts. You become trustworthy. And in, in relationships, trust is so important, isn't it? And where, do, where does trust come if not from sila? So safety, trust... Um, and a warm and friendly, kind atmosphere. These are all underpinned by commitment to five precepts. And the five precepts also act as meditation objects. So in daily life, when uh, so much going on, it's not like sitting in a meditation retreat center. Uh, how do you keep your... Um, your values in mind. Um, what are you mindful of? Well, you're, very, you're mindful of, I, I will not uh, abuse anybody physically or verbally. I won't take anything that doesn't belong to me. I won't lie. I won't take drink or um, drugs. And that's how you safeguard your yourself um, and maintain a sort of self-respect. Um, and when you keep precepts, it's, it's difficult. There's a lot of challenges. But if you can do it consistently uh, over a period of time, this, this sense of self-esteem and self-respect just comes naturally. And you start to like yourself a lot more. You know, you really kind of um, find you're, you're like a friend to yourself. Um, you, kind of, you don't feel you always need to get away from yourself and go somewhere and be with someone, you can just be content with yourself because uh, you think, kind of uh, recognize you're a good person. You know, you can uh, maintain standards um, even when things around you are not supportive. So this is why sila provides a you know, foundation for samadhi and banya. Um, <clears throat> because you're not acting and speaking in ways that are causing internal um, agitation and guilt and shame and all these things. Um, but you're acting in ways which you can feel proud of and, um, and you can you know, sort of feel this um, sense of self-respect. <coughs> okay, we were going to have a, um, a longer meditation, but let's just sit for a few minutes before we end the sessions.